Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, why do teenagers grunt and how can we engage them in learning? And I'm in conversation with Adele Bates. What that means is that I've had juice poured on my head at work. I've been whacked by a skateboard and I have taught a year seven, 11 year old people how to read their very first word. So I support school leaders and teachers and teaching assistants and of course, more recently homeschooling parents and carers as well um, to empower the young people who have behaviour needs or who are, are identified as having SEMH, so social, emotional, mental health issues. I'm the forthcoming author of Miss I Don't Give a Shit, which is due out later this year, and I'm a TEDx speaker um, 2020, which of course means we're on delay and, you know, it'll happen when it happens. So, yeah. There's a swear word in the title of your book, Adele. How daring of you. <laughs> No, don't tell my mum though. That's the thing. <laughs> tell my mum. <laughs> oh, tell it. me off. <laughs> so, so the title for today's episode, though I fear we may fear, feel, I'm sure we'll go many places, but we're starting with why do teenagers grunt and how can we engage them in learning? So tell mm. me, make a start on this massive question. <sighs> okay, so there's a direct answer to that, which I will get to, but I have to tell you about something that happened to me two days ago, made me very enraged. And then afterwards I thought, that's okay. I'm talking to Pookie about teenagers in a couple of days time. So, and I am going to name and shame the town that it happened in, because I'm hoping that we can instigate change. I'm currently staying in Dorchester. So if you are sitting there and you're working, listening to this and you work for Dorchester Council, please sort this out. Um, I was in the local park and it's beautiful. It's one of those Victorian ones with a bandstand. And we are, this is being recorded during lockdown in the UK. So there are very few places for young people to go. The schools are closed and lots of other spaces are closed. And there were some teenagers there. And from my perspective, someone who works in so pupil referral units or alternative provisions or special schools, particularly with young people with behaviour needs. From my point of view, these ten teenagers were like little rabbits, like really not doing anything. They would say please and thank you when you walk past, you know, and they just happened to have their skateboards and their bikes. And maybe they were rolling a little bit, but they were not near any, um, you know, old people or babies or anything. They were being very respectful. And then out of nowhere, this very angry park attendant came out and went, Oi, you shouldn't be having your skateboards and bikes here. Get out of the park. I started having a go at them. Then I, <laughs> I can't help it. My poor partner, she's always telling me off for this. But anyway, and I, I went up to him and I went, Oh gosh, um, do they have a skateboard park? And he said, No, it's closed. And I said, Oh, that's really sad, isn't it? Where else could they go? And of course he couldn't answer me because there is nowhere else for them to go. And I'm not blaming that parking attendant specifically here. That's not the intention of this story, but I just think that is such a good example of how teenagers are just faced by discrimination and prejudice all over the place in our society. And then when, when we start to unpick the question that I will get to, um, about grunting. Let's start there. Let's start in the context of the world of these young people. What is it like to be a teenager right now? Well, what it means is if you happen to have your skateboard under your foot, you're gonna you're gonna get that kind of aggression. And I just wonder if a uh, if I had my skateboard, would I be treated in the same way? Um, and I know that I'm not. <laughs> I know that things changed once I was perceived to be more adult. Um, in my kind of look at my identity and there's all sorts of other examples where that can come through there's a wonderful book by um, Jay Griffiths it's called Kiff and it's all to do with the the landscape that the the kind of environments that we have available for our children and our young people now and where they're allowed to be safe and this is the other thing that concerned me because I thought about those teenagers 
um because it's the kind of thing i worry about and i thought well where are they going to go um and the thing is if we if we shook them out of the communal spaces that are supposed to be safe mm -hmm. and open and you know lit when it gets darker etc where are they going to go they can't go to the skate park they can't go to the park it's locked down the, the schools aren't open so they're going to go what down the back of an alley down a car park down a, you know and suddenly the risk to them becomes so much higher as well um so that's the kind of big um that that story just i think exemplifies so much to me um in terms of this question around teenagers and why they grunt would you like to add in there or should i go through to the actually answering the question no go on go through and answer the question i mean I, yeah. yeah i think uh, I, yeah i I, I certainly, and, and something I would like to unpick more through the episode is the idea about teenagers being misunderstood and whether we, yeah, whether we almost create a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes, or mm -hmm. just sometimes we just neglect to realise that, you know what, they're pretty awesome, a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. So from the one side, we've got the, the kind of environment, the context that teenagers are living in. And then on the other side is all the wonderful ha, 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 um, biological changes that are happening in the internal landscape for a, for a teenager. And for my book, I've been doing some research, research rabbit hole, um, into this a bit deeper. And oh, I've just been so fascinated and, and um, excited by it because the neuroscience is backing up what I already knew in the classroom which is always it's always good Not when it bad. works that way isn't it <laughs> so when we look at a teenager's brain it was thought in the past that a teenager's brain was just simply a bigger version of a children's brain or a smaller version of an adult's brain um but it's not the case so the the, the developmental stage of your brain when you are a teenager is different and if you know just a little bit of how and why which i'll share in a second it just makes communicating with teenagers so much easier and engaging them in learning so much easier um so i will say if this is something you really want to know more about the, the person that i found that i've really got so much from is dr um, dan siegel he's got lots of youtube videos and a fantastic book called brainstorm and so what he explains is that the, the part of our brain, so the limbic bit, which is at the back here, that's the part that's connected to our amygdala and is responsible for all our emotional responses, the fight, flight, freeze, etc. And this part in the teenage brain develops before anything else. <laughs> so they are by their brain is biologically wired to be on alert essentially and there's a really fantastic reason for this this is similar in all mammals and the reason for this is because you spend your you know and i'm going to talk now um about let's say a, a child who has a secure childhood it is different if you've obviously faced um, adverse conditions but if you've had a kind of secure childhood upbringing you've been a, you've been dependent on a, on a primary caregiver and part of the process of becoming a teenager is to become independent and in order for that to happen we have to start fending for ourselves and so it's actually really clever that the brain does this first because it's keeping us safe mm -hmm. because for the first time you know we might be going down the town on our own and our parents aren't there so we need to be you know be more alert and looking after ourselves in a way that we're not used to yet because before that the primary another adult would have gone with us so in one way it's fantastic because it protects us but then it also explains why when you say to a young person oh do you mind taking your coat off at the start of the lesson you can be you can be faced by <laughs> it's because that part of their brain is looking for things that might be harmful and so their reaction um, to you as the adult, just asking them to pick up that. For me, it was my dad always telling me to pick up my bag out of the kitchen and take it to my bedroom. I used to be like, Rah! I can remember doing it. Um, but the reason is, in the teenager's brain, you are that saber tooth tiger, or there's a potential that you could be. And so the reaction's bigger. And then, equally, just to make it even more wonderful, the, the front part, the prefrontal cortex, 
um, in this part of the brain, which is responsible for logic and reasoning <laughs> and things like imagining yourself in somebody else's position or analysing or reflecting, all of those kind of skills, it hasn't developed yet. Um, and so there's this, you can see that that misbalance or no, that's wrong. That's suggesting something's wrong. I'm wrong. That's suggesting something's wrong. Let me think of a better way to put that. This wonderful, <laughs> this wonderful development that is is top heavy on one area, very much in order to keep teenagers safe, is is the thing that often it comes forth as as their reputation to us, and I think that is partly then why we have this discrimination, why we have this stereotype, why we have like you said, Puki, that fulfilling prophecy, and then it's really hard to get out of that. It's really hard to pick under the surface of that. And so the grunt that you might get, um, there's lots of other reasons as well, and we can go into it if you're interested, but in general, that that grunt, that kind of rah, is is that reaction, um, that very biological reaction that needs to happen. I mean, and I haven't even touched puberty. So. <laughs> Buckle up, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. <laughs> okay, so basically, if I'm understanding, you're saying that we see this because their brains are wired to kind of almost give like a, a, a fear response. They're, the world is quite a scary place to their brain right now. Everything is a potential threat. And so we're seeing like a big reaction when, yeah. So they're a little bit more emotionally dysregulated maybe? Yes, yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a good way of putting it. I suppose to our eyes, yes. To our yeah. eyes. So, okay. So does this happen at the same age and stage for everyone? Can it happen earlier or later? And are there things that we can do to make that more livable with both for us and for them? Because that can't be, yeah. it can't feel very nice. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, it happens anywhere between 12 and 24. Oh. Uh, which is interesting, which is, this is why it, it is different from puberty in that sense. And unfortunately there's some, hideous um, statistics from the World Health Organization about the, the largest causes of death in the West for teenagers is risk behavior, mm. risky behavior. And, and this is connected to this piece around um, the need in the mammal at that stage to create independence. So they are, they're, they're testing boundaries more than they ever have. And they're testing boundaries in a way that um, is different from adults because when we test boundaries we've already got history of testing boundaries so we can still gauge we've got experience remember we can connect in with our prefrontal really easily um, a lot of us you know in general and um, and so we're able to make kind of educated guesses whereas a teenager you're doing it for the first time and you're finding out if getting drunk and going up on the scaffolding is a good idea how are you going to find that out you're going to go and try it <laughs> <laughs> um and so yeah that kind of risky behavior unfortunately can be very um you know have severe consequences um i'm trying to remember what your question was Pookie. how we can support this yeah yeah so it's the the really good thing that i learned is that whilst young people are looking for independence at this stage it's from the primary caregivers that they're looking for independence so this is a fantastic, really brilliant opportunity to introduce other adults. Okay. And so it's a great time to look at things like mentoring or buddying or unofficial ones. Yeah. So it might be that the cousins get involved or that, you know, it could be very official. There could be some kind of scheme in your sporting club or whatever. And this is something that I really advise to parents a lot as well, who are worried about things like sex and drugs and rock and roll and how to talk to their teenagers about it. Sometimes I say, well, are you the best person to do that? Because at this time they're trying to get, a, you know, they're trying to separate themselves from you and create their own identity. You might not be the, the ideal person to have that conversation with, but actually, if you know that, but you know they get on really well with you know their uncle your brother how about this you know you can kind of orchestrate situations with that and it's it also explains to me as a teacher why sometimes i can work with a young person in a classroom and have a great time with them and then we get to parents and carers evening and the parents and carers sit there and go we don't know what's happened to our child <laughs> <laughs> what's happened to them who are they they never talk to us anymore and i'm thinking you know, and obviously I don't say it out loud because you don't, but you're kind of thinking, oh, I'm fine at school, but it's because of that. It's because mm -hmm. I will be another adult out of the 
um, primary caregiver childhood home scenario. And, uh, and so what they're doing at that stage is looking for different ways of living. And part of that process is also obviously criticising the way they have lived. And that might be why there is a, a lot of uh, negativity or aggression towards home, because they're kind of going, I mean, I remember when I found out like, that I always got 50p for a tooth from the tooth fairy. And then I found out my friends got a pound. Like, <laughs> it's a small You've thing. You've carried this burden a long time, haven't you? I have. Come on, I'm I have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is that a thing of kind of going what you always thought was the way? like the way um actually isn't it? and then there's a whole world to discover out here and i think one of the things that we can do as adults supporting these young people is to offer opportunities for them to explore that in in safe ways mm. um because actually there's and Dan Siegel talks about it. if there's opportunity, whether it's in their learning or social activities or whatever it is, that they can do some novelty seeking and some um, exploring of different identities and, and approaches to life. If they can do that in a positive sense there, then they are less likely to need to go to the gangs. Yeah. Because you probably have noticed, Pookie, that also at this stage, um, we can understand why some very vulnerable young people um, when they're looking for that other adult or other adult role models why gangs kind yeah. of come in there um i mean there's some of the kids that i work with they are hooked in by the gangs from about the age of eight or nine wow. um and and i think the gang members they're you know they're clever people and and they know that certain young people who don't have a secure upbringing in particular um, not all but um young people at that stage as they're coming into that puberty and brain development stage they're looking for other things and then oh there's this really cool bloke and uh, you know what he's giving me the latest iphone you never did mm. you never gave me the latest iphone parent blah, 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 blah. and you can kind of see how that can play out so yeah it's it's creating those opportunities um and teenagers are so creative and can be so positive because they don't see the boundaries in the same way as we do um you know, I don't think it's a coincidence we've got people like Greta Thunberg who's kind of going, why are we not getting this right? <laughs> she's, she's awesome, to be fair. I, yeah, absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> and, you know, she's not the only one. Um, there's young people I, I used to do in one of my mainstream schools run the Amnesty International Club, and they just didn't see the boundaries that I saw as an adult. They would just be like, well, that's not right. Can we contact the Prime Minister of Egypt? <laughs> And I'm kind of going, let me work out how that might be possible. Um, you know, they have this amazing ability to really re-envisage what the world could be. Um, and I think that if we can kind of get on the back of that and enable them to do it, they have they have the opportunity to make really positive social change. I think that that's true. And it's, it's one of the things I find myself reflecting on quite a lot at the moment um, is actually what a phenomenal generation we have coming up through right now like i feel like i don't know they they seem to have a thirst and a capacity to make things happen somehow that feels unique to this moment in time and maybe it's not and it's maybe to do with my age and things that they are interested in but it i don't know i just i find myself incredibly in awe of a lot of really quite young people who are just doing amazing things and and then you think about you know kevin the teenager and that stereotype of what we're meant mm. to be teenagers like and it's just not my experience actually no, at all no it's not mine and you know even some of the young people i work with who let's say stereotypically people would think are the worst behaved you know the the least kind of uh, engaged with society most of the time i find that that doesn't come from them no. They have a thirst to make things different and to to make the world better and to connect with people. Um, but, you know, the kids that I work with a lot of the time have have been given that label excluded. And guess what that does to your self-esteem? You know, it's... <laughs> And I think I, I wonder there if there's a kind of I, I don't know how one resets that, but, you know, I, as you know, have two daughters. So they're in year six at the moment. So the slightly younger of the two turns 11 next week. And honestly, ever since they were tiny babies, so they were first, uh, you know, when, when I first had both of them, they were six and nine months old. So Lyra was nine months old when Ellie joined the family at six months old. And even at that age, people were saying to me, oh, you're going to have two teenagers at the same time. Imagine what that's going to be like. 
and it was almost like people were preparing me for this really awful time and what I and maybe I'll swallow my words when they become teenagers and I'll be proven totally wrong on this but what I've actually found to be my experience with my children is the older they get the more brilliant they are they are turning into fantastic young women and like every child they have their moments I have my moments too but they are inquisitive and wonderful and brilliant and there's so much about them that's great and I can't really see why just because at some moment they will become teenagers that should change. Mm -hmm. I really do feel it is something to do with their place within society so another um, another kind of little social experiment that I do <laughs> um, is if I am in a new place and I'm lost because I often am and I don't have the internet on my phone because I'm actually from the night uh, what did it, like, I was doing great, great expectations once and a kid actually said to me miss are you from this time <laughs> this great <laughs> expectations time anyway I don't have the internet on my phone um so often I'm wandering around a place getting lost and if I can I will ask directions um from a teenager every time if I possibly can because people don't ask them mm. you know and if they're hanging around the streets all day they usually know the streets really well <laughs> And there was this fantastic experience I had in Worthing where there was a, a couple of lads hanging out and it was, you know, that bit where it's it's slightly warm. So all, all the teen boys take their tops off. Oh yeah. <laughs> trying to do the hard man thing. And they were kind of standing there trying to do the hard man thing with these cans, but they weren't beer. They were like, I don't know, Red Bull or something. Yeah, yeah, energy <laughs> drinks. Yeah. Oh, those monster ones. Oh yeah. Um, so they, you know, I suppose, and I, I do get it, if you don't work with these young people, I can see why that exterior might be intimidating. Um, but I come from the place of, well, let's let's connect with them and see what happens. So I went up and I could see they're like, why, well, you know, why she come to talk to us? She's going to come and tell us off. That That's going to be their initial initial thought. They're coming to tell me off. And I said, oh, I'm a bit lost. I need to get here. Can you tell me? I know you're not supposed to do this because they cringe, but he was so cute. Um, <laughs> his, his little chest puffed up and he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you need to go down here, down here. And it was, but you could see because I had asked him, I'd put my trust in him. He was the expert in this situation. Um, and none of that was made up either. It wasn't like some kind of weird learning exercise. It was like, I generally need to know where I'm going. And then the most beautiful bit at the end, he said, but actually, you know what? I don't want you going down. It was probably, it was like middle of the day, but he went, I don't want you going in that subway. It's just not safe. I wouldn't want you to go there. And he said, and I'm not just saying that because you're a young woman. I would say that to a big black man as well. <laughs> I was like, bless him. Like he, <laughs> not only is he looking after me and looking out for me, but he's also slightly aware of, of sexism and racism and you know he's, he didn't I'm know you saying, very well though did he because i'm betting you were like i'm going down that subway then mate yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um but it was just this again just this beautiful example of if we connect with them as human beings nine times out of ten look what happens yeah. um and i mean there are so many stories like that where i can think of where i was doing a training once uh it was around inclusion and a participant shared with me that she was once going down the street it was night and she said she was walking along the path and there was this gang of teenagers coming boys as well coming towards her um and she was feeling quite scared and intimidated and it was a hooded they were all black boys as well and she was like going along and she was getting intimidated she was just going to cross over when she realized one of the boys was her son Oh, wow. You know, wow. so, I mean, there's so many layers in there because obviously mm. um, we've got racial issues in there as to why black boys would be deemed to be more intimidating than white boys in mm. some circumstances. But we've also got this massive thing. She was scared and then it was her very own son. Wow. And she said it was such an incredible experience for her because she just realised how strong media society mm. um, prejudices um were affecting her wow. to make her in that split second be scared That's of her amazing. own self it's amazing how you can have moments like that though that really flip your thinking it reminds me of a completely unrelated moment but it, it comes to mind 
of um at one point when I was very ill with anorexia one of many points but um I had that whole body image issue of you know that's very stereotypical thing if I'd look in the mirror and see someone who was grossly overweight when in fact I was very underweight um, and actually for me it was never about weight but I did have that um sort of distorted view of how I looked and one day I was walking along and I caught sight of um my reflection in a shop window but I didn't realize it was my reflection and one of the things I spent a lot of my time doing was just looking at the people around me and noticing their weight and I noticed this very thin ill looking person in the reflection in the window and the moment that I realized it was me it looked completely different um, and it was a really important moment for me because it made me realize that what I seeing wasn't you know what I was seeing wasn't true and I guess maybe for that that mum seeing their sudden suddenly you're like oh this is fine I know these people they're my people this is okay um yeah it just flips your thinking doesn't it but um yeah that's wow that's incredible so so if we judged our teens less or if we assumed the best in them rather than the worst, which is maybe what we're thinking we're doing at the moment, do you think it would make a difference to how they actually behave? Absolutely, yeah, because the the lad who gave me the directions, as I walked towards him, his body language was getting ready to defend himself. That was clear. I could, I could see that he was getting into the like, oh, what's she gonna tell me off for? And, I gave him an opportunity to, you know, created a platform in which he could do something positive. And he shone. Mm. You know, he absolutely shone. And I see that with my kids in the classroom as well. Really, really simply. They Okay, so they come in and they haven't got their tie on and they've forgotten their pen and this, that and the other. But you know what? It's the first time they didn't get their lighter out and try and set a light my book. <laughs> which is which is useful when you're teaching English not to have books that are on fire. So I think there's that saying, and I don't quite know where it comes from. Maybe you do. What you appreciate appreciates. No, I don't know where it comes from, but mm. I like it. And I th I just find that to be so true. And I think the other one that I really like, which I talk about in the book, is uh, Kim S. Golding's approach of um, connection before correction. And I led a training uh back in the days when that was allowed physically in <laughs> london and i was coming back honestly i do spend my days on public transport just <laughs> trying out all my theories with teenagers so i was on the public um, on the train and it was the time when we had to wear masks and this lad was doing the classic mask on the chin thing and the teacher and me couldn't help but kind of twitch a bit because he wasn't following a rule um and so I experimented with uh, Kim Golding's approach, this correction, uh, connection before correction. So I thought if I just say to him, your mask isn't on right. I mean, he was much bigger than me. That's the other thing I think about teenagers. Often they can be like a foot taller than you. Yeah. <laughs> Arms and legs everywhere. Um, and I thought there's no point in doing that. I do, not, I do not want any conflict. That's not my intention here. I wanna help keep him and all of us safe in this carriage. So I started off, he had a school uniform on. So I said, oh, are you from this school that I'd just done the training at? And he said, oh, no, 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 that's down the road. I'm from this school. And I said, oh, right, okay. Had a meaningless little chat about that. And then all I had to do was go, for the purpose of those of you listening and not seeing <laughs> this, um, my hand is showing the action, like just a lift your mask up action. And he just went, oh, yeah, yeah, and pulled it up. I'm not with that. I think, again, that's just another example of how connecting with him first then enabled me to just just help him, guide him um, to to follow the rules that were in place at the time. And I mean, put that in an education setting, you know, and it's it's simple. And I think this is the other thing. Um, I'll get on my soapbox again because I think that teenagers are learning. They're not adults. And the real challenging thing is sometimes they look like adults um, and sometimes, depending on how they've developed physically, we might mistake them for adults and, and put the same expectations as we would on adults. And yet they're still working things out. They're still trying things. I mean, most of us did stuff as teenagers that we wouldn't do now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, my, my, yeah, exactly. And so... I just don't quite understand sometimes why we're so 
on the other hand, like let's say toddlers, right? Toddlers scream and shout. You can tell I'm not early years. Toddlers scream and shout, right? And if you see a toddler screaming and shouting um, on the street, um, you might feel very sorry for the parent. You might kind of walk away because it's a bit loud, but you've kind of got this understanding that they're probably teething or they're hungry or they're tired or whatever. Like small kids, it seems to be, are allowed to do that in general. And yet when a teenager screams and shouts, there's this there's this kind of um, like expectation that they should know better. That phrase, I really hear, I hear that a lot in schools and I really hate it because they should know better. They might have been taught better at some point, but clearly at this point they need to be reminded because they're children and they're learning and they're developing. Yeah. And surely it's our jobs as the adults who support them to do that. And sometimes, I mean, I was on, again, on a bus and um, there were these young lads and they were, I don't know how much your lads are on here, but they were, they were using the C word a lot and um, very loudly in that kind of teenage, oh, he's a flipping, and you could see everyone getting really, really uncomfortable on the bus. So I turned around and just went, oh, um, did you know you're using language that's a bit naughty and there's, there's some young kids over there? And immediately they were like, oh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't say, don't say that. <laughs> and they, they, they um, what's the word? They kind of regulated their own language. They didn't need me to tell them off. They didn't need me mm. to be aggressive. They just needed me to remind them of the social etiquette of being on a bus in public. That's all wonder, they needed. I wonder if that's a bit about um, the, you know, what you were saying before about kind of size and appearance though, because I'm not suggesting for a moment that uh, raising children is like raising dogs. However, um, we have um, little dogs <laughs> And I think we haven't tried as hard with training them not to do things like jump up or bark um, as we would have done if we had big dogs. Because I think when a big dog jumps up, then that's really a problem and people get quite scared by it and stuff. When you've got a little dog and they do it, it's irritating, but it's kind of harmless, isn't it? And I think maybe that's the thing, you know, with the again, with the toddler versus the teenager, there might be reasons there, but actually it's kind of scary if a, if a big kid mm. is big and loud and... Um, yeah, and, 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 and acts in that way. Um, similarly, my, my daughters have a friend whose older brother has Down syndrome. And it was always a challenge when they wanted to play with him because well, he was several years older than them, but was, was at about the same level in terms of play when they were younger. So he really wanted to play with them. But because he was not a five-year-old, he was a 14-year-old. He wanted to play five-year-old games and rough and tumble, but he was massive. Um, and so we had to work really hard to make sure that that wasn't kind of scary. So there's something just about literally the physical shell yeah. maybe and the actions not matching up, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then there is that whole thing. I mean, I see it more in general in um, boys, um, myself, but there is this thing about, it's like the arms and legs grow before they realize. And so it's like, they can't quite control them. <laughs> They can't quite control their limbs in quite the same way. Mm. Um, I think you're absolutely right. It's, I think there is there is a physical thing. And, you know, we are all going to have our biases. Um, and I guess that a bias that looks at something or someone that is bigger than us, mm. I imagine there's a very human instinct in there that we have to override. Yeah. Yeah. But you love you love teenagers. You spend your whole time working with the kids who everyone else is crossing the street to um, to to avoid. And it's not like, you know, you're right at the sharp end in a lot of your work, aren't you? You think you it was it 17 years you've done in um, well mm -hmm. across all different kinds of, of school and, and setting. Why why do you choose to do that, Adele? Because there are loads of different ways that you could earn your keep and working with our more interesting children is is probably a harder way, no? Yeah. Well, my first career, I was an opera singer. And oh, really? Yeah. Um, so I was an opera singer for eight years. And I did, uh, I had an interactive opera piece, right? So I would go to spaces that aren't usual opera places, uh, like bars and pubs and a drag night and somebody's bathroom. And <laughs> I would do interactive opera. Um, so it was really like working in spaces that um, people weren't really aware of the etiquette or like what opera is supposed to be and I you so you could be sitting having your dinner and then I'll, I would just come up and warble in your face um, and usually people thought I had 
a microphone, <laughs> which I didn't. Um, but I, I did that a lot. And there's something I do enjoy being in spaces where, um, where there's that kind of um, maybe like pushing of expectations and, and experimenting with what's allowed and what's not allowed and things like that. And then I got to a stage with the opera where, because I also did what I call straight opera as well, like being in a, being in a theatre and, and being on stage. And I just wasn't enjoying it anymore. There was just, oh, alongside it always, I taught. So I'd always taught performing arts and I'd worked in, by this stage already, I'd um, worked in pupil referral units, alternative provisions, etc. And I always ended up teaching performing arts, whether I was supposed to be or not. <laughs> it always kind of went that way. And I discovered this gorgeous crossover of the energy and the, the natural skills I have to hold a space and to hold a room safely, translated so easily into mm -hmm. the alternative provision um, school space. And then on top of that, even when I worked in mainstreams, I would notice that a lot of the young people known for their behaviour were sent to me to come and do the drama class or come and do the whatever we were doing screaming and being trees I don't know what we're doing um and I just started to find that actually these skills were completely um completely crossed over and especially I mean I used to do opera nights where I used to sing and there used to be stag parties in <laughs> and actually I'm sorry but a load of drunk stags and um mm. teenagers behaving from this a lot of similarities there but the difference is in one of the spaces I'm a teacher and it's my job to be a role model to help them to learn how to access society in a more positive way in another area I just got my bum pinched and I would have to deal with that so it was like actually I want to be in a space where I can I can create change and where I can engage in social change and and because I'd always kind of done this teaching and I'd always kind of attracted like I don't know if I attracted, but I was attracted to working with young people with behaviour issues. I think also there's an energy thing there. Um, I am much more comfortable when I'm, I'm working with young people who express outwardly. Um, even if it's completely extreme, I can hold that a lot more naturally than a child that goes inwards. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've learned, and of course I do that, but it's it's not naturally where where my you know my best skills lie. And so. I just got more and then I just found like I, I started doing more and more teaching and enjoying that more and more and then the final bit was when I did an opera it had 30 women in right 30 sopranos never do it a very very catty atmosphere and there were two women who were supposed to be oh, what was it one of them was the main part one of them was the understudy but the costume department could only afford one dress but one of the women was larger than the other one. Oh, and it, it was just ridiculous. And they they had this full on shouting match. They were in their wow. mid thirties. And I sat there and I just went, what I want to do with my life is be able to be a person who can affect positive change. And in this scenario right now, as another member of the cast, it's not my place to get, to get in the middle of these grown women who, in my opinion, should know better. Um, and so that was a real turning point where I just thought, actually, what I'm doing in the schools, I'm enjoying way, 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 way more. Mm -hmm. And I just love holding these safe spaces for young people to, and I think it goes back to what we were saying at the start about teenagers, is allowing them to be in a space where, you know what, sometimes they do need to scream and that's okay. Or they do need to get angry and that's allowed because anger is not a bad thing in, its, in and of itself. And to be able to hold these spaces. And then on the other side, um, I think the reason that I became freelance and started doing a lot more public speaking on this is because I also enjoy motivating others and inspiring others to and and um, encouraging and empowering others to go, you know what, you know, you you can do this too. There's, there's no kind of magic trick here. And I love doing that as well. So as my mum would say, I like to bang my drum. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. Bang my drum for a, a, a minority that's um, that experiences discrimination, and yeah, I'm away. <laughs> and you seem to have fun with it as well. I mean, I always really love. Um, I feel I'm missing out on it a bit at the moment because there's not so much face to face. But your insults of the week um, just really make me chuckle, and I just love your ability to go. You know, I'm 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 an expert in this. Here are some ideas. Oh look. <laughs> 
is when a child was really cruel or you know yeah. often they're quite funny actually aren't they and they're not even necessarily intended to be unkind but it does make me chuckle yeah. it does make me they chuckle. are funny if, if you're listening you don't know what we're talking about so on over on twitter i'm at adele bates z and we have a hashtag insult of the week do come and play along so for example one of my favorites is um <laughs> I was working with an autistic pupil and um, she arrived in her taxi and her key worker was away, which, of course, can be a very challenging um, kind of change in routine. And so they said, someone in the staff room said, oh, do you mind going and picking her up? So I went down to the, to the taxi and did my whole hello, welcome to school. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> she just was like not having it close the door again and I so I had to kind of get her to wind down the door the window and I said okay you know I, I'm sorry so and so is not here and I know that's that's not ideal I know that's not normal but is there anything wrong with with walking up with me what what would be wrong with that to which she replied your face <laughs> <laughs> and it took me 45 minutes plus two extra members of staff <laughs> convince her to walk up the drive from the taxi but you know it's because in her world something was already wrong yeah. and why should she you know she didn't feel safe and you know I completely understand the why of it but just in that moment <laughs> you know, and I did have to go well unfortunately that's the one thing I can't really do much about um so I tried to make a game of it and I was like how about if I if we walk up like this and I pulled faces to see if it would help but apparently that was unimpressive and don't be so cringe um, so yeah, those are the kind of insults that I managed to get into. How many characters are we allowed on Twitter now? 140, no. No, I think it's 280 these days. We can write an essay, basically. It's, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. But yeah, if you have any insults, you can join in. <laughs> yeah, I, well, yeah, my children do it without meaning to, mostly, I think. I don't think they, they realise sometimes the burn, um, largely about age. Um, this is one of the things that I, I'm finding now my children are getting a little bit older. I consider myself to be relatively young because many of my peers are older than me. Um, but, uh, I mean, obviously that would make them not yeah. my peers. But you know what I mean? Like, a lot of the people that I work with, I've usually worked with people who, yeah. are, who are older than me professionally. Um, and uh, so I consider myself relatively young and I'm younger than most of my children friends parents however as far as my children are concerned I was you know conceived at the time of the dinosaurs um yeah they they find it hilarious when I talk to them about my childhood and how things were then um yeah but you know that's uh yeah but no I, I think everyone should share that I, I talk often about gifting mistakes um, and how when we're brave enough to share our mistakes uh with other people it means that they don't have to make the same ones but um yeah and sometimes I think it's important mm -hmm. for us to to laugh at those too um my my most recent mistake was absolutely um, yeah yeah, my most recent mistake was yesterday. Uh, this isn't in, in any way helpful in terms of professionally, but I think sometimes we just have to realise that we're all really struggling just to manage each day at the moment. I made my breakfast smoothie. So a lot of smoothie because it's me, my husband and one of my daughters all have this same smoothie every day for breakfast at the moment. We like routine in our house. Um, what I hadn't realised was that the new smoothie jug that we bought has a completely removable bottom so you can clean the blades. Great for keeping it clean. Not great when you've filled everything up and then you lift it up to put it on the machine and there's no bottom in it and it just went everywhere and I just stood there with this jug in my hand and we're in the, we're just about to put the house on the market so we're trying to keep it all pristine and I'm just there and there's just carnage in the kitchen and we just laughed you can't sometimes all you can do is laugh so but yeah I think and I think in exactly. the same way like your insult of the week reminds us that you're human and that this stuff happens to you too and I think sometimes we have to remind people that yeah there's the stories that we share and the professional persona but we are we are human too I have um, some Absolutely. questions that came in. It's, it's a whole. Sorry, go on. We're on a delay. I think. Go on. You were going to say. Sorry, I think we're lagging slightly, aren't we? Sorry. No, I was just going to say it's a whole chapter of my book where I cover how to not take it personally when you're faced with behaviour that is challenging you as the adult. Um, how can you not take that personally? And it's exactly for that reason. And I think underneath the frivolity of sharing hashtag in sort of the week it, it, you know it's it's fun but underneath that is is support for one another and i think that is absolutely integral because i can definitely still go into a space and for whatever reason um 
not be able to hold um, the, the challenging behavior that's coming towards me. Maybe it's something that triggers me personally. Maybe it's something uh, that this young person is experiencing that is so extreme. Um, you know, there's all sorts of reasons, but I think underneath that insult of the week is kind of hands up, it still happens, like, and it always kind of does. And I think especially for early career teachers, that's useful to hear, as in, I don't have to get it right. There's no one way to behavior. Um, which is something I'm advocating hugely at the moment. I feel that there's a certain rhetoric around behaviour in education that if we all just do it this one way, then everybody will be fine. And if everybody just, high expectations is often kind of flung around and sometimes it's used in a really useful way. And sometimes it's like, well, as long as you keep your high expectations, then the children will behave. Ah. Um, you know, and I think that that, that really kind of, overtly saying things still go wrong and that's part of it because if behave if there was one way to support behavior in teenagers or, or younger children we'd have sorted it by now and our prisons would be empty and nobody would be excluded and there'd be no detentions and the joy for me and the frustration is that there isn't one way and i think on top of that something i'm just going to mention before you go into your question is i've been exploring this idea as well you know the whole thing don't smile before christmas mm when it comes to um, behavior in schools, people often say to me, what do you, do you think that's right? And I say, it depends who you are. I'm like Smiley McSmiley. And if I wasn't <laughs> smiling before Christmas, the kids would know that was something was wrong. However, I've got colleagues who were totally like composed straight people like that. And if they smiled, it, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be authentic. It wouldn't be right. And so it really depends on who you are. And I think the way that we support teenagers and the way that we support behavior is to do with how we are and how we're comfortable as well. So the way that you might support teenagers, the way that I might, it's gonna be different and that's okay. We can't all be the demon headmaster. We can't all be Mary Poppins. I'm trying, but we can't. <laughs> and, and I think it's interesting recently when I'm being hired to support schools, I'm getting a lot of feedback that they want um, a woman in because a lot of their NQTs are young women and they want to learn that behavior is, you know, you can, you can support really extreme behavior in, you know, you don't have to be an older man, which is mm. kind of the image um, that is held around education, you know, oh, they've been naughty, send them to the head, that kind of thing. So yeah, I'm exploring that at the moment in a project of my own behavior and you looking at different people with all different characteristics and how they approach behavior and you know I want to know what's it like to support behavior if you're going through the menopause like that must be really different mm. <laughs> and I don't know about that so I'm trying to introduce different people what is it like as a black teacher supporting behavior during a global social movement around black lives matter how you know all those kind of different characteristics that we might bring to ourselves I think they all affect it as well oh. So much, so much to think about. So we're coming to the end, but I've got some questions that came in on Twitter, mm -hmm. which I'm going to ask you, and we can do them in a kind of quick fire mm -hmm. way is, is, is my, my thinking. Okay. Um, partly because uh, my diary is ridiculous and I know yours is too. So we're gonna, we're gonna do this. So um, yep. Graham Chatterley asked, do you sit them in rows and make them look at you? If that is useful for the particular thing that you're doing on that particular day that works for those particular children, then do it, if that's the tool. If you're just doing it out of habit or because you don't know what else to do, then I would consider, actually, let, let's kind of rework this and look at what is useful. If they're doing group work, not that useful. If they are doing, um, if you're dictating something that they've got to write down, then maybe it's more useful. It depends on the situation. I. I, I couldn't tell whether he was being sarcastic or not. Um, I'm not very good at that ever. Um, I, I, I don't know. But anyway, I think that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, next was about um, how can we support teenagers who feel lonely, aware that loneliness is very common in this age group and a risk factor for mental health problems, um, that loneliness is also stigmatising in younger age groups, although the stigma may have reduced slightly due to COVID. Mm, yes, I saw that question. I think it was from the loneliness... I'm going to say association or society or loneliness and mental health network from ucl by the way thank you thank you um i think the first piece here is letting teenagers know that it's kind of a normal human thing to feel lonely 
it's one of the things that I wish that someone had told me. There's a few emotions that I wish people had told me. Another one is about anger, but that's another thing. But to first of all, know that it's not just them. Mm-hmm. Um, by role modeling that, you know what? I felt lonely at this point, or I'm feeling like COVID's making me, you know, lockdown's making me feel really lonely and isolated. So first of all, just identifying it so that um, it normalizes it. Now, not to say normalizes it so that it can become a really regular thing, get over it, but just in a way that they know that it's not just them. Because I think one of the annoying thing about being lonely or feeling isolated is you do think it's just you and there's very little to compare to because you are stuck in that world of isolation whether that's physically or whether that's just in your mind you know you could very much be in a group of large people but still feel isolated Mm. and so I think sharing experiences of that I think especially since uh, the restrictions we've had during Covid luckily I think that vocabulary is coming out a bit more with young people often before it was associated with older people um, so that would be my first my first step. And if we're, we're if we're going quick round, I'll leave it there. But yeah, that would be my first. <laughs> Sounds like a whole nother episode. Um, the next question. Is yeah, from, it does. Doesn't it? Yeah. So the next question is from Kevin Hewitson, who asked how through interpreting behavior can you build effective learning relationships? Um, and just to, to warn you <laughs> that um, he wrote the book, If You Can't Reach Them, uh, You Can't Teach Them, Building Effective Learning Relationships. So I kind of feel like maybe he needs to come on in another episode to answer this question more fully. But what's your view on that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> read his book. No. Um, <laughs> so I think we've touched on this quite a lot. So it's about it's about connecting with them and engaging in their world, building that relationship with them. We haven't even talked about building relationships explicitly yet, but um, building an environment of safety so that the learning can just kind of extend from that. If we start from, you need to learn this and you need to do this, well, remember, remember that part of the brain is going, hang on, here's someone telling me to do something that either I don't want to do or I'm scared I might fail with, then what am I going to do? Tush, tush, tush. I'm going to put my defences up. Mm-hmm. So it starts from creating that safe space, creating that connection, creating that relationship, and then building from there. I think that's that's quick fire answer. I like that. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally, uh, Stella asked us, this isn't a question really, but you might want to come back on it. Um, can you remind parents that teenagers moping around is usually a normal thing and they'll eventually grow out of it? And I guess my question off the back of that would be, at what point should we be worried? Because I think individual families sometimes don't know. Like sometimes I think we overassume that what we're seeing is just adolescence when it might be depression, um, for example. Mm-hmm. But then sometimes we go the other direction and we end up kind of labeling something that's just normal. Yeah, it's so hard, that line, isn't it? And it, it will also be dependent on the young person and their situation and your context, because of what looks like depression in one situation will will be different in another so my suggestion is keep the connection keep the line of communication and for teenagers that might not look like how it looked when your kid was a child so as a child you might have been able to go okay we're going to talk about this and this is what's appropriate and this is what's not or you know you might have been able to have more of those conversations and if a teenager is closing and moping and you know cutting you out of their world a bit find other ways to keep connected so whether that's even if it is daft things on whatsapp messages or you know things like that even if it's your own child um it's keeping that connection even when it feels really thin so that if you are concerned you've got a way in Whereas if you cut it off completely, then it's really, really hard to go in and try and connect when what you want to talk about is their, I don't know, addiction to drink. Like that's quite a big, heavy topic to take. Whereas if you've always kind of, if I don't know, there's a, a TV program that you actually both watch or there's, you know, you're still keeping these little connections here and there, then when you need to talk about bigger things, you've already got your foot in the door. That's great advice. What um, what thought do you want to close with, Adele? What thought do you want to leave in people's mind at the end of this episode as we close? Mm. I think it's I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a dare and I'm gonna double dare you back to think about a situation in which 
when you see a teenager next, maybe just see how you can make a connection. And it might be as simple as you smile at them. That can be massive. That can be absolutely massive for a teenager. And, and I'm not saying they're gonna come back at you with gleaming fun and unicorns, um, but just see if you can connect positively with a teenager in your life. Um, because I think there's a real opening piece we can do there that could really help them feel more accepted in society and then help us play the world with their ability to see past boundaries that, that as adults we, we put up. Mm -hmm.